Tate became the most viral person on the internet. Uh, him and I were speaking uh, when he got out of jail, and you know they're now on house arrest, and we're having a conversation uh, about some of the things that's going on. Uh, he went mm. from evolved from being a guy that was an atheist as a young guy coming up. Yeah. Okay, then he started seeing what the Christian, you know, Christian denomination was doing and what they stood for. Some these are interesting principles. Kind of welcomed it. Then he partially lost respect in the Christian religion, the denomination that started compromising and saying, yeah, we'll accept this, we'll accept that, we'll accept sure. this. What about this? And then he says, the only religion that seems to not break when it comes down to their values is Muslim. And then he went and became a uh, Muslim, and that's what he supports. Now, that may be extreme to you, but the part that when I talk to uh, a lot of the youngins who are following him and mm -hmm. following what he's saying, that argument is a good argument to say if you are going to be a conservative, if you are going to be a Christian, sure. well, your church is starting to say, yeah, it's okay. Pope, it's okay. You can come in. As long as you bring money, you can come in. You can come in sure. versus the Muslim saying, hey, you can't. So what, what do you say to the criticism the West is getting by a lot of people saying the West is no longer what it once was and – it's past the tipping point, meaning there's okay. no longer a saving yeah. of the West. What do you say well, to I, that? Well, the first part, you're probably right. I mean, we're in a complete terminal decline. And it's hard to disagree with that. A moral decline, economic decline, financial decline, fiscal decline. I don't think we're past the tipping point. To the Andrew Tate part, I think that's a bad reason to convert to Islam. I don't think that's a good reason to convert to Islam. But because there's plenty of uncompromising Christian churches but generally, yes, it is true that a lot of Christian denominations are becoming more mm -hmm. like the world and not following the word. Happy to talk more about that if you want. But that, that is the question is where is the West? And you kind of got to have to take a pulse. There's plenty of reasons for optimism. I'm seeing a kind of renewed sense of patriotism in certain sects. I'm seeing what we're doing at Turning Point USA. I'm seeing parents get more involved in school boards. At the same time, we're living through what Nietzsche predicted in the 1860s, 1870s, and 1880s, where he did not proclaim it, but he stated God is dead. And the next, and again, that's it's misquoted because people think he was celebrating the, the death of God. He was not. What he was saying is that, hey, you in the West, if you are going to replace God with consumerism and the Industrial Revolution and hyper individualism, be careful what's going to take its place. And we're kind of living through the kind of mixture of synthetic worldviews that take its place when Christianity or a, a cogent Western morality uh, deteriorates. So what do I say to the compromising Christians? Well, stop compromising. And then I, I wouldn't also necessarily say that Islam is attractive as a substitute of that, but I'm happy to explore that. It's, if it's, not, like. about, it's yeah. not about the substitute of that because they, uh, there, there's some stats we looked at a couple months ago on a podcast. We had this guy that was talking about how de de you know, underpopulation is the problem, not overpopulation, how the world that. can handle it. You know, and then we looked up the numbers on the podcast and we saw, I'm, I'm going to be wrong by a couple percentage points, but pretty close within a couple percentage points. Out of 100 people that are born in the world, 33 were Christians, 31 were Muslims. But out of 100 people that die in the world, 32 were Christians, only 10 were Muslims. Which means the young, you know, Muslims are having more sure. kids and they're a lot younger, which means by 2035, the world will be led by Muslims, having more Muslims in the world than sure. Christians. And why do you think that message? Because a lot of times you see that message and all you think about is, well, the first thing we think about is also Muslim extremists. I mean, every Muslim is a Muslim extremist, which is not. It's a smaller sect of uh, the majority. But if, if, the, if the messaging, what are they doing that their messaging is more attractive for NBA players, football players, Hollywood? Some sure, people yeah. are starting to say, well, I'm, I'm kind of going to lean towards this than Christianity today. Yeah, I don't think we have to speculate. I don't know if you have... Cassius Clay up there, which was his name before Muhammad Ali, yes. or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. We do. We actually got well, Cassius Clay up there. Yeah. yeah the, the the idea of men. Dave Chappelle, by the way. Yeah, Dave Chappelle. Is, is he a, is he a I Muslim? believe so. Is that right? I didn't know that. Um, Tyson. What? Tyson. Tyson. Yeah. It, it, the idea, especially black men, being drawn to the Muslim faith is not new because it really does. It's unapologetic in the patriarchy, right? So in a hyper-feminist world, it seems attractive. 
And again, I mean, Malcolm mm. X wrote extensively about this. I, I mean, I don't subscribe to a lot of the appeal of it because Islam is not true in my worldview, but that's, we could discuss that. I don't think it's actually useful of our time today, but you're, you're hitting on something really important, Patrick. In a world that has gone mad in chaos, people yearn for order. Now you could be too far in the order direction, which I think Islam goes too far. I do not want to live in a theocratic fascist country. I like have freedom of speech. I like having dialogue. I like private property rights. I like entrepreneurship. That's why I think the West is the best because you balance order with spontaneity and unpredictability. If you just want order, you can live in Saudi Arabia, but that's not a free society. And, but I think the West has gone way too far away from having order as a bedrock principle. What the founders tried to establish in the Constitution, especially because of the world that they built it in, is how do we have liberty, but also we have the rootedness of eternal wisdom so that liberty does not become licentiousness. And that's exactly what we're living through, is that it's no longer the pursuit of what is good, it's the pursuit of what makes me feel good. And those are two different things. So people like Tate, or people previously in the 60s or 70s, I mean, you could list a lot of people that convert to Islam because it's very attractive because the strong man archetype is not just present in Islam, it is demanded in Islam. That the man is the not just the head of the home, the head of the society, and so it's very attractive in a world that's gone mad. I think that's the wrong answer, to be very, just to be clear, but I can understand why certain people would be gravitated towards so it. So who, who would you say today is the most famous non-pastor Christian in the world that's getting others to say, I also want to be a Christian. I, I don't mean Joel Osteen. I don't yeah. mean if you go to some of the big pastors that we have. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a guy that's in Hollywood, that's in the NBA, that's in the MLB, that's in music. Yep. Who are some of the biggest ones that are converting, that are converting? Yeah, I mean, I, maybe Tim Tebow, but he's not exactly as successful. But you're, you're pinpointing something really powerful here, which I totally agree with. First of all, if you find, I mean, Justin Bieber is not exactly someone I would consider theologically sound, right? But at least he says good things about Jesus. <laughs> but the Christian world is lacking in the cultural figures that embrace the worldview, whereas in the 50s or 60s, you had John Wayne. Mm -hmm. You had every major act, not every, but you had Joe DiMaggio. You had, before that, Babe Ruth that were outspoken Christians. And now you look in the world, it's either secularism or just kind of as agnosticism. And any Christian celebrity that might be outspoken, they have to always preface it with social liberalism. I would say maybe Mark Wahlberg, he's done a pretty good job. I was just going to say Wahlberg. You yeah. saw what he did on I think that's Ash beautiful Wednesday. what he's it's, done with, yeah. the, you know, with the Catholic faith. I'm not moved Catholic. to Nevada. Explain why he moved out of L.A. to go to Nevada with his family. And he's yeah. thinking about turning Vegas yeah. into the next think Hollywood. About it. He even just caught some heat. Of course he did. From just doing the Ash Wednesday. A, they say he's a gay hater or whatever. But, I mean, but, but, that, but this is exactly where I'm going with this. Yeah. So where I'm going with this is the following. Is... So, uh, so yeah, that where, image right there. whereas a lot of people who are uh, um, Christians will go and they'll go in a community that's safe and they'll talk to one another where it's a safe place, whereas Muslims will go out there and they'll baptize and they'll convert, where, you know, if you, if you look at the two and you'll say, well, one is staying quiet about it, the other one's being bold about it. One is advertising why he is, the other one is not. But at the same time, the media will defend Muslim, well, but that, the media that, will not the defend Christianity. Yes. The, the sports teams will say, hey, you have to be a little bit more understanding about the Muslim religion, but Christianity, they Correct. can get shots. So how did that happen? The evolution of where Christianity went, hey, the Judeo-Christian, the great nation, America, yes. look at the values and principles that we have. Where did the fall happen? Boy, that, that's a powerful question. It's hard to pinpoint a certain year, but there's certainly an era in the 60s or 70s these revolutionaries took control of a lot of institutions and the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times, got perverted and changed. I encourage anybody to find me a Netflix, Amazon, or Hulu documentary or film in the last 10 years that portrays someone that is a Christian in a positive light. And in fact, this was pinpointed recently, I can't remember who, an actor came out um, and he said, hey guys, why is it the pastor always has to be like the abuser or the embezzler or the, and you think about the archetype, right? The archetype is if you see a Bible in an Amazon film, 
you almost can assure that that person is going to be a villain or at the very least a hypocrite. Rarely is that the person that is going to be acting ethically, acting morally, and that's a complete change. And it's done rather subversively, right, in our, in our culture. And so, but here's the thing, kind of the post, post-60s worldview, the moral view that came in in the post-60s, and it didn't really set in until now, it took 60 years, is hyper-individualism. And I'm all for entrepreneurship and for people to succeed, but you must balance that, you must counterbalance it with duty and obligations. If it's all about just the pursuit of your own pleasures and your own delights, you will be not just empty, I think you're gonna be miserable. And so we build an entire society, I think, on this very dangerous moral pretext, and we wonder why we have the most depressed, suicidal, anxious generation in history. I, I totally sympathize with every accusation of American Christianity that you could imagine. They could be hypocritical. Their churches are too big. They don't give enough to the poor. I think some of that is a little silly. But it is a fact that as we have turned our back on American Christianity with the roots of it, that we are less free, we are more confused, and we are filling it with these other fake religions that we could talk about. The religion of anti-racism, the religion of scientism, right? Even earth worship at times, which is hyper, you know, global env warming, yeah, environmentalism. Yeah. And so there's a great book by Tom Holland. He calls it Dominion. It's not a great title, but he it's Holland with an E. But yeah, it's how the how Christians remade uh, revolutionized the world. I encourage everyone to read it. And he's actually a secular agnostic who argues that what we consider to be common sense, what we consider to be normal is a traditional inheritance from the Christian history. And you might not like Christianity, you might not believe Jesus is the king of the world, I do, but you should at least accept that if you remove Christianity as the bedrock of your civilization, be careful what you fill it with, because currently we're filling it with garbage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so a couple things based on what you just said. One, I, I, I saw Andrew Schultz the other day. You know Andrew Schultz, the comedian. I don't know if you're familiar he's with so Andrew familiar. Schultz. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's, to me, I think he's one of the most talented comedians. I can watch his clips on replay, and the guy makes me laugh over and over again. There's really, only a really couple really guys that make good. me do that. I've he, probably seen his clips. I just he, he, You, you know in. who he is. Yeah. He's, he's incredible. Cool. He said the other day he went to church. Yeah, yeah, he's great. And he says he went to church the other day. He says mm -hmm. in the first three minutes of being in church, he started crying. I mean, just, that's not his brand at all. Mm -hmm. Andrew wow. Schultz's brand is not to this say wasn't a that. Joke. No, this was no. not a joke. He was being serious about it, right? Now, if you go to the Justin Bieber story, and we can go to Hillsdale, you know, not Hillsdale, Hillsong. but uh, Hillsong and all yeah, that and stuff. I, I Australia. saw that firsthand. Yeah. I saw a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. so a, a lot of that, the, the challenge then becomes also to say sometimes, the, the, uh, you know, it's overly judgmental on who's going to be the Christian to help bring the brand and, you know, bring others towards it. There's a challenge with that as well. But... You know, for me, I saw Wall Street Journal's article recently came out with values. I'm sure you the saw that as well. Of yeah, values. the collapse of the Where American values. Patriotism, community That's right. involvement, having children, and going to church have just descended in meaning. But money is up. Money is up. Yeah. And that's that hyper-individualism. That's what you were talking and, and about. And yeah. again, I am a capitalist. I think that markets work, but they must be in harmony with other duties that make the money meaning meaningful otherwise yeah. it's just nothing more than pleasure or things that will erode in dust so it must point towards something you must aim high that was the western ideal right and that's why the declaration is such a beautiful document it mentions god four times and in fact in the end of the declaration it's basically a prayer we don't teach this to our kids it's an appeal it says we appeal to the supreme judge of the world and they're pointing high to something larger than themselves it's very platonic, to use a phrase that was earlier, that there's things that we can't quite feel, that cannot be looked at in a, you know, cannot be looked at in a microscope, but we know they're real. We know love, we know justice, we know mercy, we know kindness, we know compassion is real. And in fact, we need to build a society around that. What the postmodernists and the post-structuralists have done post-1960s is they basically say, if it's not material, if you can't see it in cause and effect, it's not real. And that's, that's, an, that's a tragedy to believe. And so, yes, the, the byproduct of that is, so you have two things happening at once. America pulls back from its values that wants to find Can you it. go to the uh, yeah, chart it's, it's uh, if you go up. a little lower? It's very powerful. But then the, they kind of buried the lead. In fact, they didn't incorporate it, which I just want to reiterate. It is a fact that we are the most depressed, most suicidal, most anxious, most medicated, most alcohol addicted, 
in history. Now you might say, well, Charlie, it's causation and correlation. Hard to say that they aren't connected. Hard to say that if patriotism, religion, community involvement, having kids collapses, and all the negative indicators skyrocket, that there isn't some sort of relationship there. What, Tom, what, what do you think needs to happen for uh, a man to get on his knees and say, I need God? What do you think needs to happen for that to take place to a nation? Great crisis builds great response in the heart of any man. Yeah. After 9-11, you saw the unification of America in, in an amazing way. Because whenever you have a great crisis, you, you will inherently point back to a great tenet or a great truth. And what happened on 9-11, the great truth was nobody messes with the greatest country in the world. And I'm part of that. And I'm proud to be part of that. And I'm coming together with my neighbors. And I'm upset about this. Yep. And I'm healing together. And I'm mourning together. And I'm angry together together the word together keeps coming in the age of moral relativism as we see here everybody's truth is okay so starting in 1968-69 if you were to study that there were about four things that came together that make it very understandable for a crack in the heart of the populace in the population one is you know, you have the death of Bobby Kennedy, the death of Martin Luther King. You've got the summer of love. You've got the senseless, the people that believe the senseless sending to war of, um, of our young men. If you, if you didn't get into college, going to war, tough. You know, if you manage to get into college, oh, so if your family could get you into college, you don't have to go to war. Well, you know, talk to Al Gore and, and W about that. They both took advantage of that privilege to stay out of the war. And there was this crack that happened there. You had the loss of these leaders. You had the, the also the loss of faith in the, in, the, in the elders of the time because what was happening there and the great summer of love where everybody thought, well, then all your truths will be okay. That was well intended. But what happened in the middle of that is if everybody's truth is okay, PBD, then there's no one ruler for standard for morals. There's no one ruler for standards That's of what is patriotism, what is faith in America, or what is good, or what do we do for our community. And suddenly, everybody's truth is okay, and you can't judge me, becomes the, the, the boomerang that comes back. The unintended consequences is you lose control of the whole thing. And so I think great crisis is needed, what will bring America back together. And unfortunately, great crises are usually very painful in their own right. Can I say, of course. I that was really beautifully put. I'm... You, I didn't even think about the, the college enrollment draft thing prior. The issue, though, Patrick, is that if you have moral chaos, tyranny comes next. And there's a totalitarian impulse that is running through our country. We call it identity politics, political correctness, is that the, 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 the answer to this will not be more freedom or more liberty in the short term. It's that it's going, we're going to need instruments of meaning. So then we're going to need somebody to tell you what to do, which is one of the reasons why I think this COVIDian fascism was accepted by so many Americans for so long. And so you get strong leaders, quote unquote, strong leaders, if the moral fiber of your country decays. If I can just add to that, I, I believe everything you're saying is accurate. I, I also think that there's sort of a messaging problem because you talked about the Joel Osteens of the world or even the Mark Wahlbergs of the world who do you think is more likely to convert the everyday person to love America and to fear God again? A Joel Osteen or a Mark Wahlberg type? I would argue that you need this in the pop culture zeitgeist. Yeah. It's not going to take a religious leader or some sort of apostle that's going to convert everyday Americans to start loving Americans again or go to church more often. It's not going to be a religious leader. You see the fastest growing religion in America these days is atheism yeah, and agnosticism, non, right? Yeah. And non-denominational or just non-believer. Mm, yes. Um, so we need to, kind of like what you're saying, we need to make loving America again and American values yes. and Judeo-Christian -Christ values pop culture and cool again. And until that's done, I think we're going to have this same conversation for years and yeah, years and to so come. So my argument is that the American founding is the great rallying point. I think that it's so beautiful. It's so exceptional. It's so rare in human history, and it also, I think, people yearn to actually love the place they live in. I know that's an unusual thing to say. I think people actually want an excuse to love America. And so I think the promise of the founding can be that great unifying, that you could disagree on tax policy, disagree on immigration, but let's at least agree that these founders were onto something very big, bold, and beautiful. And we're recipients from, and then understand what that is. We get a real conversation about that. If Strategy. I can, if I can give you one yeah. thing, Britt, that 
if that's the answer, which it might may or may which not it, be. Okay, yeah. which it is. So you remember the movie The Patriot? Yeah, with, with Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson. Who, by the way, is a Christian. That we put him okay. on the list. He's good. I mean, talk about. We saw a what movie. happened to him after Passion to the Christ. Yeah, well, well, he's doing number two now. Yeah, but that movie—I don't know if that uh, preceded Passion of the Christ. It was it might probably have, before. And yeah. Braveheart? Are you kidding me? Yeah. But that guy made loving America Amen. and fighting for America cool and in the pop culture. So it's going to take something like that, kind of what I was saying, in the pop yeah. culture. To make young Americans, Gen Z, 16% is not proud to be American. You're not going to get them to start loving America by saying, hey, read the Declaration of Independence, buddy. I I, I acknowledge that. I'm not even, uh, trust me, try to get them to read the (laughs) the preamble to the Constitution, let alone the first paragraph of one of the core human events that becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands that have time to another. To get them to even read that, what does that even mean? I'm talking about the eternal compelling truth behind it, right? That maybe, and if not, then mm-hmm. we're a lot farther gone than I would like to believe. But I totally agree. I mean, Tom Cruise's Top Gun Maverick, praise God that that was the number one movie in the last year and a half. Yeah. I think that is evidence in my favor that people enjoyed kind of the pro-Americana yes. vibe, right? The kind of, you know, we're going to go up against the bad guys. There now, was no bad guy. Who Name the bad guy. No, that's what was, it was so just, interesting. It was, it was no it, country. They didn't identify it. it, it, it almost but it was it, just it was about America. intentionally abstract yes. almost, right? And it was about rallying behind a team. And it really didn't pander that much to identity politics. I mean, it was a little bit throughout. But it was largely a movie that could have been made in the 80s or 90s, which is yes. why it was so successful. You, you, know, you, know, you know what I think needs to happen. This is my ideas Okay, on this. First of all, for me, uh, uh, the enemy, if you study enemy, how it did whatever it did, it always divided. If, I, if, a, if a person, today we're having a meeting upstairs, we're having a manager's meeting, and I said, the biggest challenge in a, in a marriage, who's the biggest enemy in a marriage? The biggest enemy is when the spouse becomes the marriage. It's always better to have an external enemy than an internal enemy. The worst type of enemy is the internal enemy. We have internal enemies right now. And the way they're doing it is they, they're going, they're so brilliant, dark but brilliant. They're going straight to the top of influence and they're crippling them. Straight to the top. But did you see what he did? But did you see what she did? But your parents, they don't know what they're doing. Your parents don't care about you. If your parents came out, they would probably judge you. You know what? This is how we are. We are a little bit more this way. So they're dividing to the point of influence, okay, whatever the influence is. Now, Mel Gibson may be a guy who I can watch all day his movies. I think he's fantastic. I think it's funny. He can do funny. I think he can do, you know, drama. He can do anything. Put him anywhere. He's going to do great, right? Yeah. But I think you need to get somebody like the face of the NBA, the face of the NFL, the face of Hollywood. Like, it needs to be a rock type. It needs to be a Michael type, a LeBron type, a Brady type, a person like that that's willing to talk. So if they're going to work that way to come Mm -hmm. and take the influence from the top, you got to go get some of the guys at the top. So if you like this clip and you want to watch another one, click right here. And if you want to watch the entire podcast, Click right here.